And that moment I realized in my core, again, that thing I should have known before, but I didn't really know in my heart and really believe that in a different way was that Christ alone satisfies and he alone is enough. And that if tomorrow Christ answered this prayer and all my other prayers, that in my deepest dreaming and my deepest praying, that he would be the answer I really needed, not all of this. And that if he wasn't enough to satisfy me, none of this would. Welcome to Mamas in Spirit, a podcast pointing you towards God in everything you are and everything you do. I'm Lindy Wynn, and it's a blessing to be with you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this gathering. And I almost have to giggle as I start today because it is a profound blessing to be with you today. By the time this is released, I will be so well and so healed, but super unexpectedly, my husband and I came down with COVID. Praise God, he has done so well for those of you who have followed Mamas in Spirit and know that he's immunocompromised. So praise God for that. But I'm not in my normal recording studio for those of you who are watching this on YouTube. I'm tucked away in a little corner in my quarantine and so thankful today to be here with Elizabeth Margolini. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us. Well, Lindy, it's such a privilege. I uh, We are connected by a mutual friend, and I'm always grateful to meet other amazing Catholic women like you. So this is such a treat. Well, the feeling is mutual, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth and I have been chatting just a minute, and we've never met before. And I already hear that we have so many things in common. And the most glorious thing that we have in common is like with everyone here, and that is our deep and abiding love for the Lord. And wanting to follow God's holy plan in our lives. So in that spirit and the Holy Spirit, let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Dearest Lord, first and foremost, I just want to thank you for the gift of life. I This time is just a reminder of our vulnerability. And I know this has been a, a very long two and a half years for our world. And so Lord, I just want to thank you for, for being with us always, for being present to us, Emmanuel, for being in us and in all of our experiences. And that when we so choose to turn our hearts to you, that you transform us, no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're doing, you are here with us, guiding us. And I want to thank you for that and that blessing in my life and Elizabeth's lives and all of our lives that you give us a divine plan for us to follow and to say yes to you. So today, may our yeses to you, Lord, be greater than ever before. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So Elizabeth is going to be starting today to talk to us about her beautiful journey of becoming a mother, a very unexpected journey, ending with the blessing of beautiful Zelly. So Elizabeth, can you share with us that story? My goodness, Lindy. Um, I love sharing this story. And I like to say this at the outset, because this story really has very little to do about my husband, Matt and I. Um, It has so much more to do with the goodness of God and how he's working in our lives, even when we may doubt or be angry or frustrated um, at the path he's leading us on. Um, I know that all of us walk through different seasons of life of feeling maybe abandoned by God. I think that's a real ache in a lot of hearts, um, whether it's for a season of life or maybe it's a deep longing that you feel that God has never answered. Um, Those are tough wrestlings, I think, with the Lord. And so our journey to Zelly really addresses that topic because our story began, um, Matt and I met at a castle in Ireland, true story. Um, we got engaged, got married, um, you know, envisioned ha- welcoming um, what we thought would be, you know, a large biological Catholic happy family. And it shortly became clear that that might not be God's plan for us. We didn't anticipate that. We were very surprised. But We struggled with infertility for four years, um, and that's still a part of our story. But during those years, we walked the journey through kind of an openness to foster care. We had been married about two years, two and a half years, I guess, when we decided to begin the process. Now, what happened in the middle of that was COVID. And so our application process, our certification, all the checks, everything, took, I mean, it was like a year and a half. So a a really long time. 
We're licensed to foster. So uh, if any of you know much about the foster care system, you're dual certified in a lot of states to foster and adopt. And so Matt and I were. And at the time, we thought that the Lord might have been calling us to foster and maybe adopt. We were very open to that through foster care. So in our heads, I think we thought, okay, we'll be open to be an older child or maybe siblings. Like we have no idea, um, but we just want to be really docile to what the Holy Spirit was wanting. So last summer, 2021, we were certified as foster parents. We we're called about several different placements for one reason or another. We never received one. One we came particularly close to, and they called us 30 minutes before. They had us like change our whole room, prepare for twin girls. So we got out and got bunk beds, you know, redid the room in 24 hours. And then 30 minutes before they were supposed to show up, they called us and they said that they weren't coming. And so this was sort of this like rocky, challenging journey with some of the more, and I, I, it's no secret that foster care isn't for the faint of heart. Lindy, you'd know that even better than I would. But in this process, I think what we learned and came to understand was that something you said, Lindy, before we started the podcast, that God's plans for us are better than our best laid plans, our biggest dreams. So a few months after being certified as foster parents, my husband and I took a pilgrimage to Italy. Greatest intention for us in going was to receive the blessing of a child in whatever way that God wanted it. But at the time, we thought biologically was sort of what we had in our mind. And don't we do that? You think, Lindy, when we pray is, you know, we we ask for, for a certain kind of, we ask for prayers, but we have a really specific idea of how God's supposed to answer that. <laughs> And that was, we were no exception to that story. Um, and so we're traveling around Italy. We visited the tomb of Padre Pio. We visited St. Michael's Cave. We went to Assisi. We um, went to Maria Goretti's tomb. Um, I feel like we were hitting like the all-star MVP heavenly list of powerful intercessors. <laughs> And we had this amazing experience. I think it was the second to last day of our trip, a culmination of a lot of kind of spiritual work that had been done on that trip. We went to the Holy Stairs in Rome. For those of you who don't know, it are the stairs that St. Helena brought back to Rome and were hidden, actually. The, they were in, the, I believe, the papal apartments for hundreds of years. And then a few hundred years ago, they, there was a church constructed around them. These are the stairs that Pontius Pilate like, had in his praetorium that Jesus would have walked up to to meet with him and then walked down to be scourged and then walked back up to receive the final judgment. So it's a really holy, beautiful site. And a priest at the top of it, a friend of ours who was traveling with us, prayed with us for a very long time um, at the top of the stairs. Just, again, kind of one of these spiritual moments where I think you have this awakening or a, a moment of clarity that something that you knew before, but you really didn't know in your heart before. And at the towards the end of him praying with us quietly, he's praying praying over us silently or I I have this moment where I'm looking at Our Lady of Sorrows who was across from us I'm um, just a beautiful statue of her and for those of you who have seen that image or maybe not it's Our Lady closed in black and then it's her heart pierced by um, seven swords like the prophecy of Simeon and I'm looking at her and looking at her heart and to be honest Lindy I I think at that moment I realized how frustrated I was how angry even. And in just how much I think this journey, this kind of this struggle, the highs, the lows, the Lord, I thought that foster care was what you wanted. And you, this even doesn't seem like what you wanted. I, I was so mad at him. And I felt really abandoned. I think that it can be easy to as a as a Catholic couple when you're in this position, you can feel like, Lord, we're we're being open, we're doing, you know, we're doing the right things, we're trying to honor you. And isn't that a good thing? But Lindy, I think what I learned in that moment looking at Our Lady was how can I, for one minute, look at her who received a son and gave him back for, I mean, for all of us in the most grotesque, gruesome, brutal way and loved us enough to have a child and then willingly lose him. And 
so I thought, all right, I know that you understand this. I know that you understand like our lady when, you know, moms have miscarriages, when they lose children, when they want children, like all, her heart is so maternal and so tender. And the second recognition was, even though the desire in, I think my heart to become a mother for a child, it was so good. It's amazing how our hearts, I think, can make idols even out of the best things. And I think that that had become a little bit of that story for me. And I say that in all humility. I think we see that with our world, though, that the children can become kind of a commodity. And they're not. They're a gift, right? They're unmerited. They're gods. They're, they come from him and they're going to return to him. And we are stewards of that gift. And that moment, I realized in my core, again, that thing I should have known before, but I didn't really know in my heart and really believe that in a different way was that Christ alone satisfies and he alone is enough. And that if tomorrow Christ answered this prayer and all my other prayers, that in my deepest dreaming and my deepest praying, that he would be the answer I really needed, not all of this. And that if he wasn't enough to satisfy me, none of this would. And at that moment, I am weeping and I have this great grace, I think, of clarity and peace that washes over me. And the priest lifts his hands. Now, this was all in my head and in my heart. The priest lifts his hands and he goes, it's enough. At the same time that in my heart, I was like, Lord, you alone are enough. And so I was really startled, but grateful because we, I remember going back to our hotel that night. My girlfriend looks at me and she had no idea what had happened. She was like, what happened to you? You're different. She was like, where'd you go? What did you do? You just, your face looks totally different. And I think she was right. So for, for weeks after that, Matt and I came home, we both um, credit that time looking back. We're like, gosh, we just had this supernatural piece that was completely not from us, right? It was, it was the Lord's work. And so three weeks later, we're going about life. We had begun a novena to St. Therese, again, asking for the same intention, but with, I think, a lot of joyful hope that like, Lord, we're going to continue to ask, but like, we trust that you know the answers. It was, it was a very different prayer. Um, And a girlfriend of mine was at daily mass in the next state over. And she calls me, well, she calls Matt first. And she said, Matt, I found your baby. (laughs) Now, for all of you that maybe didn't hear the beginning, Matt and I are foster parents. We weren't planning to adopt. That was not what we thought, you know, was the agenda to do some sort of private or agency adoption. Um, And she said, I, the priest at mass just announced that there's, you know, a birth mother who has not picked a family yet and the baby's due in two weeks. And she just said, I, I just felt like this was something that you guys really should think about. She said the way she told us the story later was that she was in front of a statue of the Holy Family and she heard the words Matt and Liz. And to make a long story short, Matt and I talked. We were like, all right, like, what should we do? And then he was like, OK, docility, openness, like, let's see. Like, it sounds like she's in a difficult situation. Let's see if we can help. So we talk, we are on a Zoom call 48 hours later with the biological mom um, and her Gabriel Project worker, um, which is a wonderful organization. It helps often women who help other women walk through a pregnancy with a lot of support and compassion. And about halfway through the call, she's getting to know us, asking us questions. And she says, I think we have a mutual friend. I said, who's that? Who, who do you know? And she said, Sister Mary with the Sisters of Life. Now, At that moment, it clicked. I asked her, when's your due date? And she said, October 13th. I was like, no way. Sister Mary is one of the closest. She's like my spiritual grandma. I love this lady. And she's one of the original Sisters of Life. And she had asked me three months before, like anonymously, to pray for a baby due on October 13th. And she just said, I feel like you're meant to pray for this woman. And so Matt and I had been holding her and our future daughter in prayer for three months without knowing. At that moment, all of us are pretty shell shocked. And she said, the biological mom says, wow, that's, you know, it's amazing. Thank you. She said, but that's not why I'm telling you this story. She said, I mentioned Sister Mary because she gave me the book that you wrote with your parents about your sister with disabilities. And she said, I just want you to know that when I read that story, when I heard her story, it's part of the reason that I that I have my pregnancy. 
she said, I just want you to know I kept the cover of the book on my desk and I'd look at the picture all the time and I'd ask God specifically to give my baby a family that would love her like Bella's family loves her. And in that moment, we were just overcome, I think, with all of us had tears in our eyes. The Gabriel Project worker said, you guys, when I found out who you were, I thought that's a miracle because God literally answered her prayer. So there are many other miracles with the story, but I I could drone on and on forever. But 10 days later, Zelly was born and she was ours. And there were a lot of other C's and that needed to be parted for that to happen because the county had to release a home study, which they ended up doing miraculously because our lawyer told us they never do that, but they did. They made an exception. And God really put put on a show in terms of how this path was paved. So I look back on that story and I'm just reminded time and time again, I had the privilege um, of going back to Rome over Holy Week and I brought Zelly to that church um, where he prayed over us. And Lindy just sitting there, I think, and reflecting on how at that time last September when I was there, I could never have imagined that I would have be bringing my daughter back in so short a time. I could never have dreamed that that was possible. But God knew. He knew the whole time. He knew when I was sitting there and praying and angry at him and doubting that he was already bringing our daughter into the world and that the prayer had been answered. I just didn't know it yet. And so I look at this story and I just think, Lord, you you know so so much more than I do. You, you are so wise and so good and so generous. And sometimes I think we get a glimpse at how God is working for us, even when we don't think he is. Yes. Elizabeth, you are so incredibly well-spoken and just brought us on such a beautiful journey of the heart. And I want everyone listening to know you know, everyone's stories are different. All our stories are different in regards to like the themes in them or the actual occurrences that are unfolding in our lives. But there are certain parts of it that we can all identify with. And the first thing that comes to heart for me that you shared, the word that I love that you shared for some reason is wrestled, that you really wrestled throughout a lot of this with what was unfolding in your life and what you had imagined for your life and feeling abandoned. So wrestling Mm -hmm. and abandoned, but then yet standing on those stairs, you were stripped in a sense, just like Jesus in a, in a different way, but in a similar way, like you were, you were stripped of everything, of every preconception that you had, every expectation that you had, It sounds like it was one of those moments you talked about how like you had certain things in your mind, but you had not yet gotten to your heart. And in that moment, it's almost like not only did you get to your heart, but Jesus touched your soul in that moment. And it reminds me that even for myself in my life, and I wonder if listeners can identify that so often in our lives, those most intimate moments with Christ are not the easiest moments. They're they're the ones that are barren. Yeah, they're the ones that are just filled with grappling and struggle, but then yet, in a sense, we're released in that moment. And it sounds like that was a moment of of complete and pure encounter for you with Christ and that Christ was also working through that priest that, that you were with. And then it was in that surrender. It was in that complete, in a sense of rather than feeling abandoned, you abandoning your life to Christ in that moment. I've never thought about that before. Like it's in our own abandoning of ourselves that we encounter Christ so fully. And often those come from moments when we feel abandoned. So ironic, (laughs) but so beautiful. So of the Lord. And then here, as you gave that over, this glorious plan unfolded. And my goodness, when you talk about those encounters with Zelly's birth mom and about the book that you wrote with your parents, about your sister Bella, and everything that unfolded. I mean, God's divine providence, so sacred, so holy, that could only be God's plan. That's right. I I completely agree, Lindy. I, I look at this story and I think, how can you not believe in the goodness of God, right, when you hear something like this? Because there's just no chance in all of this. There's so many other stories too. The the priests that decided to make that announcement at daily mass afterward, he met with um, the Gabriel Project worker on the feast day of Padre Pio. 
that's his patron saint. It's who he dedicated, right, his priesthood to. And on the Feast of Padre Pio, he looked at the Gabriel Project worker and he said, don't worry about it anymore. I, I know that Padre Pio is going to help me find a family. So be at peace. And we had him over, we got to meet him a few weeks ago. And that was just an incredibly beautiful experience. He's a wonderful priest. Um, but I, I thought, gosh, there's, again, no coincidences in heaven that we were just at his shrine. We made a pilgrimage to his home. And so I look at this and it's like this trail of, you know, divine breadcrumbs where I feel like we had all these wonderful friends in heaven that were advocating for us and, and showing us sort of lights along the way um, that in retrospect, I see where they were helping to knit things together that I could never have planned. Yes. And it reminds me that this was a time of despair for you and a time of difficulty, but it's like you're being supernaturally lifted and carried through all of this to ultimately the ending per se, even though it's only the beginning of God's divine plan unfolding in it. And Elizabeth, as I was learning more about you and reading more about you, and I'm I'm super touched by your parents too and your family just in general. I just, I'm so moved by the depth of your understanding of the sacredness of life and mm-hmm. and the way that your lives reflect that so fully and at such a deeply intimate level. And I actually wrote down on my notes, I'm actually going to read from my notes. I wrote, our experiences form us. They form a deep understanding and appreciation for the gift of life. And I also, having been infertile, Elizabeth, even though I think there's a million different ways that people experience and come to understand the gift of life, I mean, that really, really creates a reality that forms such a deep expression of the gift of life. Because when you can't have it as easily or you can't form a family as easily, that understanding of the gift of it and and that it is a free gift. It is a grace. It, it, it is given by God. And, and something like you said, not to idolize or idealize our own plans, but, but to give, to give ourselves to God for those plans to unfold that, that are his. I love that. Cause I, I think you're right. I, I was actually sharing that with a girlfriend of mine and her longing, her prayer, her desire is, is for a husband to live her vocation of marriage. And so I, I know that there are so many people out there that whether or not it's infertility or you're praying for a spouse, or maybe you're praying for something to change in your life that's painful or whatever that desire is. I think that the gift in the cross with infertility is that all of a sudden you feel that you can empathize in such a different way with that sort of longing for something not given. Right. Um, And I think that that's so true that it's not that I parents who have a have a child just in the way they thought love their child less. Of course not. But I think that it's a an awareness just on a human formation piece that you receive when you you do walk that road. I know Zelly was sick recently and <laughs> There was just a lot of, you know, sleepless nights and just, of course, like having having a baby that that's not feeling well. And there are so many moments where she'd be crying and she just wanted me to hold her and I'm feeling frustrated or tired. And I'd look at her and I'd be like, I prayed for this, you know, like I, I didn't just pray for the good things. I didn't pray for the cute baby clothes and, you know, the happy days and her smiles. Like I prayed for all of it. And I understand that all of it is holy and it's not just the joyful days. In fact, I'm probably meriting a lot more Lord in these moments to love her well. And so I think that I thank God for that grace. Now I don't do it perfectly. Like most of the time, like 99%, but sometimes you get those moments of clarity where you're like, okay, thank you. Like, thank you for the sped up and the tears and the snot and the diapers and all of this, because this is, this is the good stuff. I know a, a friend of mine has been battling cancer and she's really young And she wrote a post recently saying that she's like, I don't think I ever really fully appreciated things like my health or the ability to just go to Target with my kids and walk through the aisles. And but it's like any any cross, I think, where you feel that something is taken away and you look back and you're like, gosh, Lord, make me grateful, make me grateful for all of it while I have it. And if that is going to be a part of my story, let me come through that story with deeper joy, deeper appreciation, deeper gratitude that my heart would not be one of bitterness 
or barrenness, that it would be fertile ground for gratitude to spring forth. And I thank God that he was working in me when I wasn't working for myself to, to grow that grateful heart during a difficult season. You just said that you're thankful to God, that God was working through you when you weren't working for yourself. That's profound. How did you experience that? And I'm wondering too, how we all can be more open to that and to recognize that God is always working in us and through us, even when we're not working for ourselves. Cause we probably don't work for ourselves quite a bit. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying like, <laughs> this is like a girl's sleepover. I mean, <laughs> we have a lot of feelings and, you know, life can be very hard and, and days can be strenuous for people. And so how do you think that we do that? Oh my goodness. Um, I think so often the image I have in my head is if our God is a loving father and I'm a daughter, sometimes I'm a really crabby teenager who gets angry. Sometimes I'm a toddler that doesn't understand why he's taking away the bowl of candy. Like, and sometimes we walk in relationship as, you know, I'm an adult and I got it all together and, you know, Lord pour into me because I can take it. And, you know, but I think the spiritual like is, is that is that ebb and flow, isn't it? Of that relationship. Like, if God is our father, then sometimes we love him and sometimes we're frustrated. And uh, But the difference is instead of our earthly fathers, this father's pretty perfect. So, you know, he's He's perfect. And I look and, and think that in those seasons where we feel like the toddler banging on our high chair, right? Um, and we all know that feeling. We can look back and see it. But in the moment, it feels so valid. It feels so just. It feels like, Lord, I deserve this. I merited this. And I think that humility is always a powerful weapon. I think humility is always the predecessor to gratitude because pride makes us look at our lives like, Lord, you owe it to me, right? You owe it to me because I'm I'm amazing or I did things the right way or I did this for you or whatever it is, right? Like, or gosh, Lord, like, and then all of a sudden you're pointing fingers and comparing that, okay, God must love them more or God's unjust or, but if we begin with, I think the spirit of St. Therese of Lisieux, which is understanding our littleness before God, not in the sense of, you know, false humility or fragility. I don't think St. Therese was fragile. I think I wildly misunderstood her the majority of my life as sort of this kind of fainting flower of a saint. And in <laughs> fact, when you read her and you better understand her, it's that she is like this strong, beautiful woman who has the docility and humility in her heart to say, Lord, you are a better elevator, a better builder, a better creator, a better designer than I am. And so I would much rather in my littleness and my humility, have you fill me and be a, a receiving, you know, a receptacle for all that you are. And so I think in my life, like when, when I've tried to better myself in that way, and it's, I, I need to stop striving and I need to be better at receiving. Um, and I, I need to take my own advice maybe there more, but I think that's the trick. Amen. I need to stop striving. I need to be receiving. And I'm going to say in all humility, this podcast is a reflection of that for me. I mean, sister, I'm not feeling a hundred percent. And I was like, I was like, I'm recording with Elizabeth Marcolini. I think she could just, she'll carry it. <laughs> and look, amen. Oh, I don't know if I'm that. Thank you, Jesus. No, it's true. I mean, these things you're saying are so beautiful because like, I mean, I can only strive so much. I can only, you know, try to make it happen so much, but we're, we're limited. The Lord is limitless. And I just think that this is a, a beautiful expression of that. And I want that to all kind of percolate in our hearts of instead of trying so hard to strive to receive, to allow ourselves to receive from the Lord more. And just really quickly, this little memory comes back for me from Mother's Day because I was I was sick on Mother's Day and literally like through the glass with my seven-year-old daughter who, I mean, this will all pass. And I, praise God, God has blessed me with perspective that, okay, this is like a couple of weeks of not being able to hug her, but hey, it's coming. But just she put on shows for me outside. We live on land. And so we could be super social distance. And she's just out there dancing. She's like, Mommy, I have 10 shows for you. <laughs> <Ten. Aww. laughs> so literally summer in her blue roller skates on the grass. Summer in her just bare feet. Summer in her shoes. Like That's she's so just cute. dancing and galloping <laughs> and doing hilarious cartwheels and 
whatever. But I just, all I could do was sit there because I didn't feel well and just receive that. And you said something else, Elizabeth, that this touches on is you talked about basically living in the knowledge of who God is and that we're God's daughters, that like rather than relying on all the different places and spaces that that we can be in, like our tantruming moments or our doubting moments, our despairing moments, and even the ones where we feel like big girls <laughs> or, like, or like, you know, adult yes. women, like, hey, pour into me, Lord, I got this, <laughs> like, like, even though like we go through all these feelings, the Lord is calling us to 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 live in the knowledge of who God is and to constantly yeah. receive from the one who is perfect and the one who is holy while we're constantly ebbing and flowing and changing. And, you know, I just yeah. I want to point out because, Elizabeth, I imagine you in sleepless nights and in all these things, you have an array of feelings and experiences and differing amounts of energy and so do I. And so does everybody else who's listening to this. Like we're all the same that way. And I I think that's really important to name. For whatever reason, this day and age, I think that's really, really important to name. And so how beautiful yes. to think of all of us in those moments where we really don't have much to give for whatever reason, that that the Lord is is right there with us and is pouring into us and is planning for us and planning for our lives. And the last memory of yours that I want to yes. I want to touch on, Elizabeth, as a, as a mother who has been licensed for foster care. For everyone listening, you have to be licensed for foster care in order to adopt, unless you're doing a private adoption. Otherwise, pretty much all the time. So, anyways, to think of you and your hubby, the two of you, so darling, already really following God's plan, in my opinion, <laughs> my humble opinion. Like you're already saying yes to the Lord. Like, okay. We're not, we're not going to be pregnant. We're going to be open to foster care. There are so many children who need families and need homes to think of you scrambling to put up those bunk beds and to prepare for these twin girls. I'm sure with hope in your hearts and thinking like, okay, God, this is your plan. We're ready. Here we go. And then for you to get that call 30 minutes before they were supposed to arrive. I just want to say, God bless you both. I am so moved by you both. You just... You, you went, you were honest about your feelings about it. You wrestled with it, with the Lord, and you still allowed the Lord once again to transform you and to work in your hearts and lives. And I'm just deeply moved by that. I just think of the intimacy of that moment Thank of the you. two of you in that room prepping and your hearts prepping to only get a no, but then yet you still allowed God to work in you and through you. That's a, it's a beautiful testimony, Elizabeth. I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you, Lindy. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I'll never forget that moment. I I had like unloaded like chicken nuggets into the freezer. And I remember looking at my phone and it was the social worker. And I was like, my stomach just fell. I was like, I know what this is going to say. And But again, it it's amazing how I think God stretches you and he, and he sort of like baby walks you right into bigger yeses. And if there are things in, in your life, if you're listening to this and you're wondering, okay, maybe maybe I've been really hurt by past relationships and I'm afraid to date again, just go on one date, just go on one and, you know, see, see what the person's like, see, um, see what the next thing is. Or if it's infertility, if that's resonating with you, just go to the info session on the adoption you know, agency meeting or, or the foster care agency meeting. That's literally what my husband and I said when we went that day and I cried in the parking lot and I was like, gosh, my heart just hurts. And he said, let's just do the meeting. Let's just say the next yes. And remember too, that God walks with us. God is a God of the present. He's not waiting for us at the future, at the finish line. God is right here with us. He's our pacing partner. And sometimes we forget that we look at mountains and we think we're climbing alone and we're not. Um, he is going to be with you at every point where you have to say the next yes to, to, to do the next courageous thing. Um, I love one of my favorite images in scripture is Peter walking on water, because I think that our Lord in a different way in our lives calls us to that type of faith. He calls us to walk on water in the middle of a stormy sea because the focus is him and the faith keeps us from, from sinking. So 
whatever that is in your life, my encouragement to you is to say the next little yes um, to that dream, that desire, that ache to to allowing him to work in you because that's it too, right? We're, we have to be good clay in the potter's hands. We have to be malleable. Um, if, if, if Matt and I still were sitting here saying, Lord, the only way we are going to receive children is biologically, we would not have our daughter. And so I think he had to work in us to be that good clay to allow him to make something much more beautiful of our lives. I wanted to make like a teaspoon and he's making like, you know, a Ming vase <laughs> over here, you know? And and I I just think that, again, in my best laid plans, they were never great enough for him. In my best laid plans, they were never great enough for him. That's so beautiful, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, I want to thank you. This has just been delightful, and you have definitively filled my heart. That's the that's the blessing, <laughs> the unexpected blessing of doing Mamas in Spirit is I am just poured into so profoundly. It's just amazing. And so I'd love to ask you, because I asked this at the end of all the podcasts, who is your favorite saint? I Right now, I'd have to say Therese of Lisieux. She's she's been such a powerful intercessor for us in the last few years. And again, I I thought she was sort of a wimp. And now I'm like, she's my girl. Like this woman knows what it's about. So I feel myself learning from her and in her humility. There's a reason she's a doctor of the church and she only lived 24 years. Amen. That's so beautiful. And then what about do you have any favorite prayers or scripture passages? Yeah, goodness. I, a couple, actually, the scripture that I picked um, for last year was, I had two of them. One was, blessed is she who believed in the promises of the Lord, right? It's what um, what said in that interchange between Elizabeth to Mary. Um, and then the other is with um, the angel and, and Mary. And she says, gosh, I'm going to get the exact translation wrong, but it's basically like, um, like nothing is impossible with our Lord, right? Um, when she's like, how could this happen to me? And he's, the angel is like, it's all possible because with God, nothing is impossible. And that's the year we got Zoli. Talk about the impossible. I also really love the litany of trust from the Sisters of Life. I pray that every day. Um, I think it's, again, it's a walk into humility, just a reminder that our Lord is in control of our lives. So beautiful. Elizabeth, thank you so much. And would you like to close us in prayer? Yes, I would love to. In the the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together. I want to thank you for Lindy's heart, for her yes and having this podcast, for inviting women on to encourage others to be a light in the darkness. Lord, I want to pray for everyone listening to this. Lord, you know what the aches of their heart are, what their prayers are. Lord, you know what they would make pilgrimage to you and ask for. I ask them that today that they be consoled, that first of all, you're with them in that grief, in that longing, in that concern, the confusion, or the waiting, that you would illuminate the dark corners of their heart, and that they would have the courage to go there with you, that they would say the next yes, Lord, the next yes, allow you in more fully into their heart, because Lord, you are the great mover, you are the way maker, the sea parter. You make paths straight, not crooked. We trust you, Lord. We love you and we praise you. We entrust this conversation and all those listening into the mantle of your mother. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Be with the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Elizabeth, thank you so much for just this glorious sharing of your story and your heart and your walk. Wishing you and your hubby and little Zelly just so many blessings. Thank you, Lindy. What a joy to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. And I want to thank everyone for being here with us. And just know that you're in my heart and prayers. And like Elizabeth just prayed for everybody how blessed we are to be knit together and tied together in the Holy Spirit. And know you can come follow Mamas in Spirit on Facebook and Instagram and find many more faithful podcasts at mamasinspirit.com. Can't wait to be together again next time. This is Lindy Wynn with Mamas in Spirit. May God bless you and yours always.